Hola. Hello, everyone. Hi, welcome for those who are here uh, in the auditorium and those who are following us uh, online. So my name is Karini, and uh, this is actually the second talk as part of the series of presentations that we're going to have uh, this week. And uh, I hope you enjoy. I hope you had your coffee and are ready for the afternoon lecture after the one that we had with Lillian in the morning. So, let's go back to the beginning. Yes, so actually we are here and Lillian, uh, we're here early in the morning uh, as well. And tomorrow we're going to have another presentation as part of a mobility project uh, called New Horizons for Teaching and Research Collaboration between Norway and Brazil. And this uh, partnership is uh, financed by the Norwegian Directorate for Higher Education and Skills. And we have this cooperation with the Federal University of Sao Paulo and the Univ Federal University of Pernambuco. And today, I will talk about children's emotion socialization, combining quantitative and qualitative approach in developmental research. But I just want to start saying a bit who I am. So I'm from Recife, uh, Brazil, and I moved to Norway to do my PhD. You can see that's a huge contrast, and it's also a lot of learning, and uh, that's why this project aims in strength uh, international collaboration, because that's very important for teaching and research. And I did, at the University of Oslo, my PhD in developmental psychology, and now I work as a postdoctoral fellow also in developmental psychology. And I'm also passionate about teaching and epistemological and methodological discussion. And as a developmental psychologist, I like to say that I'm also mother of Leah. <laughs> I think I've learned uh, with her in practice every day. So that's very important. And then Sao Paulo is now uh, kind of a bridge also between my first background in Recife and my current affiliation in Oslo because that's it's our uh, collaboration in relation to this project. So we have me and Lillian coordinating the project in Oslo. We have uh, Claudia and Sabine who, who work here in Sao Paulo and we have Isabel and Hernan in Recife. And as I mentioned before, uh, this project is about mobility and we hope that towards the end of the project we're going to have a summer school in Oslo, and we also hope that we're going to strengthen some master and PhD um, collaboration. But the talk today is not about the project, but I wanted to give a sort of an overview uh, of the project to acknowledge that all these talks are an effort uh, as part of research and teaching collaboration. But this talk is about emotions. I, I study emotions, I'm very emotional, uh, so I think it's Always good to start uh, asking, how are you feeling today? And I would like you to go to this uh, address, menti.com. And if you go to this address, you will see um, this. And you can see a code up there in the presentation. So just type in this code. It's menti.com. So then type in this code, and I would like you to say, how are you feeling today? You can write in English or in Portuguese. And remember to click enter when you finish replying. So you see that uh, as you reply, uh, you will see a word cloud with your answer. By the way, that's anonymous, so we don't know who answered what. And the big words means that potentially those words were mentioned uh, more time, more frequently. And it seems that we have happy people. I think for Lillian, who studied happiness and talk about well-being, that's good um excited nervous anxious fine tired overloaded 
uh, what more inspired, curious. Yeah, so oh, that's good that we have a very different emotions and it's quite common that uh, maybe you are overloaded, you are overwhelmed, maybe you are yeah, anxious or nervous because you have a lot to do and still you are here, curious to, to know a bit more about this topic and I'm happy with that. I'm also happy, excited, a bit jet lagged, but uh, excited to share and exchange a bit with you. So thank you for replying. We're going back to our presentation. So emotions, that's the topic. When we talk about emotional competence, this is a broad kind of area. I use here some of the definitions by Pons and Harris that when we talk about emotion competence, we have the experiential aspect of emotion. Um, and we have also the declarative aspect. So when we talk about the experiential aspect, we are talking about the emotions that we feel, that we experience. So when I ask you, how are you feeling today? So then you say that you are feeling happy, you are feeling excited. The experiential aspect is also related to how we can regulate our emotions. So maybe you feel overloaded and a bit anxious, but we try to maybe breathe, have a coffee to calm down a bit, so you regulate. But there is also the declarative aspect or what we can call also the cognitive aspect of emotion, which is the understanding of emotions. So if you start digging into your feelings, like why I'm feeling anxious, for example, why I'm feeling excited. So I'm thinking about my emotions, right? And of course, these are interrelated. Okay, we can understand very well our emotions and still being a bit poor in regulating even though the study shows that the better you understand, the better you regulate, but it's not linear. But what will be the outline for today? Because when we talk about emotions, that's like this big umbrella. Today we are talking specifically about a concept or a theoretical framework called emotion socialization. And as Lillian did in the morning, I'm going through first what is the concept. So for you to have an understanding, I know that Maybe many of you are not familiar with, the, with this topic, so I will present briefly theory, the parenting styles related uh, uh, to this theoretical framework, and some empirical findings related to this theoretical framework. And then we're going to discuss how emotion socialization has been studied, some methodological gaps, some uh, current directions, and then I will give an example of one big project that I'm involved at the University of Oslo, which is parenting practice in Norway. And by doing that, uh, we're going to discuss the methodological design. So this presentation will be a lot about combining quantitative and qualitative approach. Uh, why, when, how. And also we're going to uh, discuss some uh, challenge and innovations related to this uh, yeah, line of research. Oh, sorry. To. Yeah, so just to contextualize a bit, this project is uh, based on the, among other uh, theories, but it's based on the ecological model of Rolf Brenner, which means that when we try to understand the development and we have the individual, like in the center, we understand that this development is influenced and influenced the, all the systems that are around. So we have uh, uh, different layers. So we have the microsystem, the mesosystem, the uh, exosystem, and the very macro, macro system, which includes like family, school, the community, until like the more like values, beliefs. So in a way, when you look at the individual, we consider that the individual brings the individual characters, genetics, uh, for example, and these interact with all these layers. And if we apply this to the emotional development, so when we talk about the emotional development of the child, we have to consider all these layers. But of course, it's really rare that we can consider all the layers in the same study, right? So we try to combine as much as possible, or at least to acknowledge that there are limitations in uh, um, a given study. 
So emotional development is quite complex. Uh, we have the within child factors that includes, for example, temperament, genetics, the, the child's cognitive skills, language skills. It will influence the emotional development and we have the environment. And that's why it's a sort of a, a spiral because it's like the within child influence the environment which influence the child which will foster the development. And of course, when we talk about the environment, we can talk about many different things. We can talk about the emotional climate of home, school. We can talk about parenting style. We can talk about emotional socialization. So the focus of our talk today is on emotion socialization. And as I said, this will influence each other. It's not a linear process. But what is emotion socialization? Or what we call emotion-related socialization behaviors. When we talk about it, it's quite, uh, we can infer based on the terminology, is the way we socialize emotions, right? So emotions are something that can be expressed. And then we, when we express in social interaction, we are socializing emotions, which means that we can socialize when it comes to the child development by the way we react to children's emotions. So when the child shows anger, sadness, help, the way I react to that, I'm socializing what I think it's right or wrong, for example, related to emotions. The way we discuss about emotions, how we talk about emotions, what our values around emotions, and of course, our own expression of emotions. Right? So it may be that, uh, oh, I never talk about my child about emotions but we are emotional beings. So we are expressing emotions basically every, all the time. So that is also a way to socialize emotions. Whether we are more or less aware about those issues, that's another thing. But to some extent, we all react, discuss, and express emotions. Which means also that there are different contexts for emotional socialization. We have parents, we have teachers, we have our relatives, we have our cultural events. So for example, recently we had the World Cup, right? So then I was with my child. So if she's experienced something that is kind of uh, a lot of emotional arousal, so she could see that the way we were kind of uh, experienced this type of event, it was kind of like hot emotions, that sends some signs, that sends some message about the way we socialize. And then how does parenting shape children's emotion competence? So our focus here will be on parents. Uh, we can think about uh, what we call parental meta-emotion philosophy. So the parents have feelings and thoughts and beliefs about emotions. It may be that they are not conscious about that, but they have. They think, for example, if it's okay for the child to express anger in front of the others. If it's okay for the child to express sadness when, for example, she does not want to go to school. So that, those are beliefs. Those beliefs, consciously or not, will influence how we express, how we discuss, and how we react <coughs> towards the other's emotions. Okay, so this uh, it, it's, the, 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 it's very intertwined, the beliefs and the practice, beliefs and behavior. So that's the, the main idea of this theoretical framework. And then I want to go to our last uh, Menti activity. So the same address, but will be a different uh, code. Yeah, so that's the code now. And now it's a, it's a scale. And of course, the scale here is very polarized. It's just to have a bit of a, for you to think a bit on the topic. And I just want to, you to answer whether you agree, disagree, or if you don't know. Do you think emotions negatively impact cognitive activities?
Yeah, so it seems uh, not a huge difference, but a slight majority agree with this statement. There are some uh, who doesn't know. Okay, let's go to the next one. It's the same quote. Females are more emotional than males. Yeah, it's like that. It's like that, yeah. Yeah, here it seems that we have the tendency to disagree. The some who agree and the don't know. Would be interesting to run an analysis based on gender. <laughs> yeah, the next one. Oh, someone still more disagree. Okay. I think it's not okay to express anger outside the family context. So anger is a type of emotion that it's uh, one of the most maybe interesting to, to study because it's, it's a hot emotion, so it, it, it's a hard emotion to deal with. Um, and there are a lot of uh, cultural aspects involved in how to deal uh, with anger, especially if we are in public. If we are collectivist culture, if we're more individualist culture, that may impact the answer. So here we have more disagree Yeah, so clearly more disagree. Yeah, the answer is when I had this in Norway, it was different. Yeah, so we, can, we might have some uh, difference, control difference here. Oops. I believe shame is a harmful emotion. Feeling ashamed or make someone else, for example, the child feel ashamed, it's harmful or it's um, an emotion that teach good behavior. Shame, or shame. shame in general, like uh, if you if you use shame to teach something, it's okay, it's not harmful. Like we learn what is right or wrong through shame, or that shame brings actually more negative uh, consequence than positive. Oh, that's that's an interesting uh, reply. I had the same question in Italy. Uh, for its Italian uh, audience, and it was very similar. Uh, we have, uh, even though here it's it's more kind of half half almost. Yeah, now it's half half. Or, or more don't know. Yeah, okay. And I think now it's the last one. The heart has its reasons that reason does not know. That's a philosophical. <laughs> it's Pascal wrong or right? <laughs> Have you thought about this before? Like not only this last question, but like all this. Have you, have you thought about if shame is good or bad, or if I allow people to be angry when we are like in a public context? Have you thought about this, like consciously? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that, that, that was more academic context. Yes. But I mean, like in our everyday life, about our own emotions, or, or if we have kids around, have you thought consciously about that? A bit? Yeah. Only in a therapeutic setting. In a therapeutic setting, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for answering. Let's... Yeah, but the point is that we all have these beliefs. Either if we are conscious about those beliefs or not, we have those beliefs. Uh, 
And beliefs about emotions are exactly how people think and feel about emotions. It's, it's a bit metacognitive in that sense of meta emotions. You think, and that's what we call meta emotion philosophy. We have our own philosophy. Parents have philosophy about emotion, even when they are not aware about that. So emotion, here are some examples that is connected to the questions that you just answered. I can think that emotions are positive and negative emotions are or are not valued. For example, it is or it's not okay to express anger in public. Boys can, cannot cry. Uh, emotions disrupt thinking. Okay, Th those are what we call beliefs about emotions. And that's why most of the parenting program, intervention program, the first step is to make them aware about those beliefs. Because sometimes we just reproduce some behaviors that are connected to some beliefs, but they are not aware of those beliefs. Uh, so based on this idea, uh, Gottman has created some parenting styles, right? So here are some examples of these styles. So you can have these missing parents. Uh, I, just, just a parenthesis here. You, if you are familiar with some literature on parenting, you might have heard about the authoritarian or more like warm. Those type of like terminology or categories, they are more related to behavior, behavior and discipline. This is uh, parenting styles, but based on how parents socialize emotions. Okay. So in the dismissing parents, uh, usually you, it's, there are those parents that want the child's negative emotion to disappear quickly. So they don't judge the child's emotions, but they try to really dismiss the situation, you know? Um, and actually in Norway, we have a sort of a, a, an expression, for example, when the child uh, falls down and then it's an opium, it's like, like uh, yeah, get up, everything is fine. You know? So then that's a way to say, okay, you, you fall, but like, oh, oh, it's maybe it's a bit painful. Or then you acknowledge the maybe the negative emotions. But in the dismissive type of approach, we tend to redirect to the positive emotions. There are the disapproving parents. And here you also tend to, you believe that negative emotions need to be controlled. And then you can judge and criticize. Like, why are you crying? You don't need to cry. And there is no reason to cry. So then I'm criticizing uh, the emotion. There is more the laissez faire, which is like, uh, does not set limits. And it's like, I accept everything. So if my child is kind of angry, sad, and then just throw things away, you just let the child uh, does that. Uh, and then there is the emotion coach parents, uh, which are the parents who value the child's negative emotion as an opportunity for intimacy. So when the child feels sad, when the child feels angry, so that's the moment that I can talk and I connect to the child and I show empathy. At the same time, you set limits on the behavior, but you acknowledge the emotion. And then I want to show you a little, have you heard about this movie, yeah. Inside Out? It's a very short scene in this movie that I want you to identify the dismissing and the coaching behavior, okay? This stuffed animal hall of pain! My rocket! Wait, Rally and I were still using that rocket. It, 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 it still has some song power left. Who is your friend who likes to play? No! No, 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 you can't take my rocket to the dock. Rally and I go to the moon! Riley can't be done with me. Hey, it's going to be okay. We can fix this. We just need to get back to headquarters. Which way to the train station? I had a whole trip planned for us. Hey, who's ticklish, huh? Here comes the tickle monster. Hey, Bing Bong, look at this. <laughs> Oh, here's a fun game. You point to the train station and we all go there. Won't that be fun? Come on, let's go to the train station. I'm sorry they took your rocket. They took something that you loved. It's gone. 
Forever. Sadness. Don't make him feel worse. Sorry. It's all I had left of Riley. I bet you and Riley had great adventures. Oh, they were wonderful. Once we flew back in time, we had breakfast twice that day. Sadness! That sounds amazing. I bet Riley liked it. Oh, she did. We were best friends. <laughs> yeah, it's sad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay now. Come on, the train station is this way. How did you do that? I don't know. I he was sad, so I listened to what. Hey, there's the train. <laughs> Yes. How can you interpret that based on what uh, we have just talked about being this missing or the coaching approach? Yeah. Who was the the one coaching the emotion? The sadness. So the happiness it was really into. Oh yes, let's forget about this. You know, uh, and I, we might acknowledge that we do that a lot. Right? Even with friends. Sometimes friends that share something with us. Yeah, but you know what? Maybe we can do something. So then you just forget. And sometimes people don't want us to fix anything. They just want some, someone to listen, to acknowledge, to validate. You are sad now. Which doesn't mean to feed the sadness, but it's just to give space for the sadness or for the anger. So here it's when the, uh, the Joy is using a distracting strategy. So she wants the child's negative emotions to disappear quickly. Okay, let's do something fun. While sadness validates the elephant's emotions, it does not say how he should feel. So there is empathy at that moment. And actually that helps uh, the elephant because he feels uh, somehow seen. I'm here with this emotion. Someone can acknowledge that. But of course, we all have challenge to emotion coaching, right? It's really hard to emotion coaching when you are leaving home and you are late and then your child is just having a meltdown. And then you just see it and talk to your child. So suddenly, so, yeah, we don't have time for this. And it's okay. When we talk about styles, we are not talking about parents who just emotion coaching. There is no such a thing. So we are talking about the tendency or prevalence of a certain style. So, for example, problems related to mental health, depression, anxiety, might uh, be something that prevents us to be emotion coaching. And one thing that's really important is that some, sometimes there are some critiques towards this approach saying that, but then that you don't uh, teach your child to have limits. Remember that validating the emotion is not the same as the validation of behavior. You can be angry, but you cannot hit anyone. But you, you, you have all the rights to be anger, angry because we all feel angry. Grown-ups, kids, everyone. So all feelings and emotions are acceptable, but not all behaviors. Uh, which means that I can express my anger through my body and my words. I may want to be alone when I'm angry, but I cannot harm myself or others. And of course, that's not an easy task. And that demands time. And that also demands that the parents... Uh, able to regulate their own emotions. And that's why we have a lot of parenting programs to help parents be more aware about their beliefs and also about their behaviors. And remember that there is an influence of the child's temperament. So for those who have more than one kid, they know that for some kids, it's much easier to be emotional coach, while for some kids might be more difficult, right? So in the same way that the way we socialize emotion impact the child, the child's own characteristics impact, impact the parenting. But why study parental emotion socialization? Why that is important? So here's a special issue. If you are interested in the topic, I recommend this one. It's a special issue on parental socialization of emotion, self-regulation, understand process and application. And then here you have a lot of findings showing the impact of uh, the way parents socialize emotions on a diverse of child outcome. 
both in terms of cognitive, emotion, and also social development. So if I just summarize a bit those findings, uh, there are uh, empirical evidence that when we validate the child emotions and when we apply more emotion coaching, that impacts emotion recognition because we also use more label to address the emotion. Sometimes if the child is feeling something, there is no word for that. And then when we can give the word, that can also increase and strengthen the ability to recognize emotions. Uh, better emotion socializations are also related with feelings of social competence, to coping strategy like problem solving and sport seeking, and also pro-social behavior and peer popularity. Okay, so here are a bit of a summary of those findings. And indeed, uh, if we summarize going back to the same table, uh, those child with more dismissing parents, usually they have more difficulty in regulating their emotion. They kind of learn that feelings are wrong. It's inappropriate. They should not be feeling that way. The disapproving also uh, tends to, to lead to, to a, a more uh, difficulty in regulating emotions. The less affair is also a kind of tr uh, trouble to get along with other children because the value that they learn is that I, I not only can feel everything, but I can do everything that I want, and that can cause social problems. Uh, and emotion coaching, they tend to lead to more uh, regulation of emotions, um, and also that they learn to trust their feelings. They kind of learn that my feelings say something to me, and they are valid, even though it doesn't mean that I can do everything I want because I'm feeling sad or I'm feeling angry. Any questions so far? Or comment? Is it clear? Yeah. yeah. Very clear. Oh, yeah. I have a question or comment if this is the time or otherwise I can just close it afterwards. If it's something that is kind of preventing you to follow the, the theory because uh, I'm finished with the theory. Ah, okay. Yeah, that's why. So then uh, it's a question actually linked to this specific part. Mm. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm familiar with the theory underneath parenting styles, but I've never really worked with this kind of data. So I was wondering, uh, in your experience or for what you have uh, for what you have read, how do you tackle the problem with the limits between these categories? Because in practice, I would uh, assume that there are some overlaps over mm -hmm. them, or even a transition, a temporal transition. Mm -hmm. So I, I could think, for example, of parents that at some point start being dismissive and then start to at some point disapproving and evolve to a laissez mm -hmm. or uh, to which extent they can actually happen at the same time. So in one situation I'm dismissive and then uh, uh, a few hours later I'm just so tired that I go with laissez style. Yes. So how do you tackle the, how do you, how do you establish causality or how do you establish your outcome when it comes to these different categories? Yeah, uh, and you are totally right. That's why, and there is a discussion like, should we call these styles, is this style a trait that tend to repeat? Uh, and then that's something that I will also bring when we discuss methodology, because that's a lot, that there's a lot to do with your question is related to how we measure. Right? So you are totally right. When we talk about style, most of the research uh, within this framework, they are based on scales. So what so it's like, there are a, a sort of a situations and the parents kind of, how you tend to reply. And it's a scale. So it's more likely to very likely to unlikely, right? Because exactly it's not that, oh, I always coach. But what we can grasp is that what you tend to do most of the time. That's why we call it style, because that's what we tend to repeat. But the same parent with the same child in the same day or in the same situation, <laughs> they can apply all this. And it depends if the parent is tired. It depends on the characteristic of the child. It depends on how often the child potentially, let's say that it's every morning that you have that meltdown. You know, and then after the first day, you might manage to be very cold. The second day, you are tired, then you start to be disapproving, and then you just let the child, and then you mix. But if you have a certain style, you tend to repeat and go back to that style more often. And that's what we try to tackle with those scales. Yeah. 
but that's really important and i will bring also the aspect of uh, there is also an, uh, uh, an impact of future what do you, we think in, in terms of cultural value it's more important for the child um, yeah exactly yeah um, yeah I will bring different. Yeah, that's what we call the intergenerational transmission of parenting style. Mm -hmm. That's what we want to tackle in this uh, parenting practice in our study. Yeah, so then how emotion socialization has been studied? I think that's the most of the time here is the emotion socialization. So Eisenberg is uh, the person like really into the field in which uh, who uh, kind of developed the framework. But this article, it's a quite a, a new one with like the new evidence. And here it's a sort of a very uh, kind of scheme showing that most of the time we, it, the studies tend to consider the child characteristic, the parents' characters, which includes like personality, for example, temperament. Uh, and they try to understand how this will impact the parenting styles and also how this will impact the child's outcome. So most of the time, those studies, they are quantitative. Uh, there are many with interventions. So then they apply some intervention um, to improve the, the, the parent emotional competence. And then they have some pre-test and post-test, both in terms of the parents' um, emotion skills, but also the child. They try to understand the predict predictive factors and potential moderators and explain uh, this variable and also how this impacts the child development outcome. So that is the, the main and the, uh, yeah, the mo most of the results and findings that we have about emotional socialization is within this theoretical uh, framework and methodological design. But we have to remember that Every time that we think about methods, what is in the center is our research question, right? So there is no like the best method. It's, there are most or more or less appropriate methods to address that specific research question. And usually our research questions, we are not inventing the wheel. <laughs> that science is there because we have a lot of different knowledge. Uh, we have to look at the gaps and limitations in those previous studies that will generate new questions these questions um, we might replicate some studies we might develop new methods that's why uh, the question here is what is or are the most appropriate methodological designs to address potential gaps in emotion socialization studies but what are those gaps in uh, understanding uh, this I would start with something that we discussed earlier today, that most of these studies are with mothers. Even though we talk about parenting, we are talking about motherhood most of the time. It's increasing, but if we compare, we have far more studies with mothers than fathers. How about teachers? Now, nowadays, kids spend a lot of time uh, in schools, daycare. How about emotional socialization among peers, child-child interaction, how they learn? from and with uh, other kids. And here I mentioned some of the projects that I'm involved that we try to address those issues. So we have now a project called Teachers' Beliefs About Emotions. So, and we do a cross-cultural study as well, because that is a, a, another limitation. We have, we lack cultural diversity. And Lillian also mentioned that when it comes to studies about like well-being and genetic, uh, so most of the time, those studies are with weird, uh, Western, industrialized, well-educated society. It's hard to compare uh, culture when it comes to, uh, to emotions because it's methodologically cha challenging. Most of the time, those studies use in different instruments uh, or different cultural dimensions. It's also the discussion about its culture or its social economic status. Uh, there is also a question that Claudia just mentioned, the intergeneration transmission of emotion socialization. We also try to address this in the parenting practice in our project, whether the, parent, the parental practice is influenced by the way I was raised. Few studies are based on qualitative or mood method approach. So most of the time we have this uh, Likert scale uh, questionnaire. We need some uh, innovations 
in order to address uh, those uh, gaps. So, for example, the combination of self-report scale and observation of real interaction, that's what we try to do in this project. We also need to understand a bit more qualitative um, both interviews, what the parents explain, the meanings around those practice, but also qualitative analysis of social interactions, which is also something that we address in this project. Uh, so now I would like to that we, we then think about emotion socialization and the parenting style and also based on the comment from Lillian as a dynamic process. We cannot think about parenting as something static. It's not a trait in the sense that, oh, that's the way I parent. I have five children. I do the same with all five. Or I do the same whatever my mental health condition. It's a process. When we think about the process, one main approach to understand this process is through self-report measures. The second way is to behavioral observation of parent-child interaction. Even though the second one, it is still underused compared to the self-report. And then I will use the parenting practice in Norway, uh, a mixed method sequential explanatory study of emotion socialization in today's Norwegian family as an illustration to discuss a bit these issues. So I will just give you a very brief description of the project, why we need to use a moot method approach, and some innovation and challenge in design qualitative studies on emotion socialization. I want to highlight that we will discuss the process, not the results of the study, okay? So in this, this project, it's also financed by the Norwegian Directorate for, for not for higher education skill, for child, youth, and family, both did. And the principal investigator is Prof Professor Egil Nigor, and here you have the research team. And in this team, you have like qualitative research, clinical uh, research, those who work with genetics, and uh, it's, a, it's a very diverse team. The general aim of the project is to understand how parents meet their children's feeling and what contributes to such practice in the Norwegian context. So our first aim is to how the parents practice their parenting with focus on emotional socialization parenting styles that I explained to you. We want to understand how uh, fathers and mothers are different, how this is different within the family, because that's another thing when you said about the, the style, right? It may be that my style and interact with the father's style, that makes us change a bit, the style. Uh, and how this difference might impact differently or not uh, externalizing and internalized behavior problems in the child. And how cultural frameworks influencing parenting styles. So that's the three main aims of this project. As I said, the design, it's a mixed method and it includes a twin design. So Lillian had explained a bit how and why twin studies uh, is important when we want to address uh, genetics and environmental uh, factors. We have in total, and this has been collected, 5,000 parents of children aged between 4 and 12 years old. Among these parents, 20% are twins. They have twins and they are participating in the study. 20% have parents who are twins. And 6% are neither twins nor are children of twins. Okay, so we have a sort of a sample of uh, twins. I'm not experts in twin studies, but that's why we have a very diverse group and we have people with this expertise. And the idea here is exactly that we understand a bit better uh, to what extent genetics and environment influence the practice in uh, parents living away. Here's a bit of a summary of uh, the design. So we have the, the first part, and that's because it's in a sequence. So we have the quantitative part first with this big, big sample. We have just finished the data collection with uh, these 5,000 parents. And what I want you to think through out this presentation, it's why we need a mixed method design. Why we just stop 
because we look like oh my god it's five thousand parents yeah. you know with twins and non-twins we have a lot of material and in this online form i'll show you uh some of the variables include many variables we could just stop but no we continue and we're gonna have interview and parent-child interaction and i want to just briefly discuss with you some ideas for this design and also some challenge for this design uh yeah so the the quantitative study it was an online form and this online form the main variables was parenting style parental stress parents emotion regulation mental health and personality children's emotion regulation and mental health through parent self-report and also the parents reply about their child's emotion uh, regulation okay so the child was not directly assessed at least not now but we aim for some follow-up studies in which the children can be assessed directly. And we have other variables. So we have the parenting style with which parents grew up. So that's what uh, you mentioned, Claudia. Uh, counter of birth, parents' education, finance, parents' work situation, gender, whether the parents live together or not, number and gender of children, proportion of the time that children spend with each parent, uh, social values and conflicts and problems solving within the couple of parents so it's a lot we, we can understand a lot so why we still need to include a qualitative design uh, so for the parenting side that's the focus of the presentation today we use the coping with children's negative emotion scale so Lillian, that's how we try to tackle with the limitations that we mentioned but it's a scale from one to seven so that also kind of uh, grasp a bit of the variability it's not is either this or that. Uh, and here are some examples. Like if my child is going to participate in an exhibition or a sporting activity and becomes visible nervous that people will be looking at him, her. I will tell my child that he, she is behaving childish. Encourage my child to talk about feeling nervous. Tell my child that if he, she does not calm down, we must go home immediately. That's not multiple choice. For each of these sentences is a scale exactly because it's dynamic it's, it's not because you just do that but you have a tendency to do more one of these three and that's what we try to tackle and here is just another uh similar example so when we have self self-report and quantitative approach that's actually it's really good because it's feasible for large sample so we can include many different variables uh moderators and then we can have like statistical power and that increase the chance to generalize uh, and understand the model uh of parenting practice we have information about parental tendencies to respond to a range of child emotions because this scale includes different emotions both negative uh and in this case it's, it's only negative but there are also scales that include positive emotions but it relies on parental insight. It's uh, and might we have uh, an influence of social desirability, what they want me to answer, right? I should talk with my child about about emotions, even though I know I don't do it. But maybe I will just yeah. increase this scale a bit more. Yeah. Uh, so in a way, it's what they say they do versus what they really do. We, we don't have access to what they really do. At the same time, it's not this scale, it's not about values. It's about action, okay, which is different. It's, it's about their behavior, but it's still it's about what they tell about their behavior. And then we, 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 we remain with this question, but how does socialization unfold during the interaction? And that's why we have emotion socialization from an interactional approach. So then when we look at the interaction, so then it's when we, we have behavioral observation of parent-child interaction, so what they do in social interaction. On the other hand, here, we're going to miss a bit the variety of emotions because it's a specific type of interaction. But at the same time, we can be a bit more precise about the emotional context that's happening in that specific interaction. But we can have the interaction approach is still from a quantitative approach. So I can code the behavior and I can quantify the behavior. I can see the prevalence 
of the behavior in those uh, interactions. But how this can be used within a qualitative approach? I don't know if you are following my kind of uh, rationale uh, behind this. Okay, one thing is that I have the self-report, I have the observation, but I can still have a quantitative eyes towards the observation. But how can we look at the interaction through a qualitative eyes or approach and why? Why is that necessary? So I would start uh, maybe think about some myths about quantitative and qualitative approach. Most of the time when we think about this, we think about this relation. We do quantitative analysis because we have quantitative data. Or we do qualitative analysis because we have qualitative data, right? And then when I do a mixed method approach, I sum up both. I have quantitative data with quantitative analysis, qualitative data and qualitative analysis. But we can have like this. When I record, video record parents interacting uh, with their children, it's qualitative data. But I can analyze the interaction with numbers. I transform the behaviors in numbers and I can run a statistical analysis. In the same way, I can have quantitative data in which I can dig in, into more the in-depth understanding in, in a qualitative way. Okay? For example, we can quantify the observation or we can understand the observation. I can understand, for example, the interaction in the moment that when the mother or the father, uh, let's think about the opposite side, the child express a certain type of emotion during the interaction. And then I try to understand how this impact the mother and the child, how the mother and the child reply to this. And then again, how the child interact to this. So that's what we call the self-regulation. So then I have the, the diet as the unit of the analysis. I'm not looking only how many times that mother or that father showed emotion coaching or emotion dismissive, but I'm trying to understand how the interaction unfolds and develop through the self-regulations between the participants in the diet. And of course, whether I do this, like the vertical, or I cross, it depends on my research question. So when it comes to qualitative research in developmental psychology, we have to remember that historically, and I remember that when I start uh, teaching developmental psychology, it's very common that the students are very eager to understand what the child can do at one, at two, at three, at four, you know, and then you kind of map all the development. And, and that is what our, the, the historical approach in development, our, uh, to understand general laws. So that specific change that happened at that specific age period, and then I want to understand general laws. But in, nowadays, or it started some years ago, uh, some decades ago, there is an increasing shift to a more social, constructivist epistemology that look at the everyday social interaction and also the cultural embeddedness. When we talk about development, we cannot only talk about what appears in the development at age one or two. We have to understand what is the process, how that unfolds in the interaction, how that varies between future. So we have to be open to analyze non-numeric representation of the world, text, narrative, pictures, and observation. So why moot method approach in developmental science? It's because we have to remember that behaviors or context relevant to human development are not inherently qualitative or quantitative, but the methods of representation through which behavior or context are recorded in research are. So that's a choice not because it's there, okay? We choose to look at this through numbers, but we have to remember that developmental science is a holistic enterprise. That includes social, neurological, and biological science. So it depends on the lens that we use, quantitative approach will be more coherent and more appropriate. Depends if we are different research questions with a different framework, qualitative will be more suitable or the combination of both. Uh, we have to remember that when we, we combine numbers and words, we, we get closer to the complexity of the developmental change. And it reaches a broader audience, 
right? Also when we want to communicate, remember that especially when it comes to developmental psychology, uh, it's very important that we make our findings uh, uh, clear for parents, for teachers, for policymakers, because that's also a strong contribution from developmental science. So then the question is when combine quantitative and qualitative approach? Again, we have to go back to our research question. So then if we think about uh, this project that I presented to you, the parent practice in Norway, in our studies, we integrate belief and practice in socialization and development. So if we examine behaviors and beliefs, this requires both quantitative and qualitative approach. So with the quantitative, we can map the prevalence of practice and factors that correlate with those behaviors. So we have numbers representing this model and we have statistical power to potentially do some general uh, laws. But with the qualitative, we understand the meanings, we understand the goals, we understand the intention and how it functions in social interaction. And more specifically, in some specific cultural families, because in this project, we include also non-Norwegian families living away. So we want to understand also here the potential uh, effect of immigration. So you have your values from your cultural background, but then you live in a country that maybe has very different values when it comes to how socialized emotions. So how is that? So it's really important to understanding those meanings. We need to go beyond number. It's not only about what's prevalent or not, but how can we understand that those families with different cultural background maybe have a dismissing way or more uh, judgmental uh, way towards emotions, which makes sense with their cultural background. And also for policymakers, it's important that they understand this variability. If we just give them numbers, I'm not accounting for these meanings behind. So then how can we combine and how we do that in, the, in, the, in this project? We have the self-report and that's a sort of a summary of this talk. We have the self-report. So here we understand quantitatively the prevalence of the parenting practice. The potential predictors or correlates because it's not a casual uh, kind of study, it's a correlational study, and the child outcome. It's personality, parental stress, uh, socioeconomic status, and so on. So here we have a large sample, and then we can make some inference uh, based on this statistical power. But then we go to the parent-child interaction in a qualitative way. So here we want to see how the parents express react and discuss emotions and how this unfold in social interaction. But then we want to go even more in depth and then we're gonna have a focus group interview with some parents about their thoughts and feelings around this, this practice. And here we have subsample because in a qualitative study it's not about quantity, it's about to go more in depth. So we want to understand the meaning for that particular group in that particular context. So if we summarize how we combine uh, quantitative and qualitative methods within this theoretical framework, the first part in a way we assess what the parents say they do, but here we have a large number, we have a lot of variables, so we have a lot of ways to control as much as possible. In the second part, we investigate how they do it. The third one, the meaning of what and how they do it. Okay, so we have numbers, we have observation, we have words, we have narratives and meanings around those practices. So that demands a lot of innovation and challenge in the qualitative design. So currently we are working on this design and we just like with a brainstorm, just for you to have an idea. Um, and we are working together to find, of course, based on the, the literature, but also on the specific uh, methodological design. For the parent-child interaction, we are discussing which interactional situation we should be looking at. We have some ideas that we can co combine some reading book activities. So the child, we try, it's a still, remember, that's not a naturalistic observation. It's still in the lab. Okay, it's even better to be qualitative to go in their home, in their like daily lives. 
Uh, but then we try to create a sort of a setting that resembles a bit like daily activities. So we know it's quite common that the parents sit and read at that age with their kids. And we are trying to find a book with a lot of just image. And then we want to see how potentially the parents will express emotions, talk about emotions using that image and the conversation. This will be video recorded. We want to combine with free play and also that at the end of the section, they have to tie the room because that might generate some frustration for the child. You know, I don't want to do this. And then we want to see a potential negative emotions uh, in this situation. And then we also aim to do an individual interview about the interaction. So in which uh, the father or the mother who participate in the interaction will watch themselves in the video and then we're going to have an interview to explore a bit uh, why they did that, why they react to that way, to that emotion, talk. It may be that they're not even aware about what they were doing, you know? And here we're going to grasp again the how. It's not about quantity, but it's about the how. Uh, yeah, and that's why we are doing this, I just replied. And for the group interview, uh, we aim to explore uh, the perceptions and feelings around being a parent today, what it means to be a parent, how they feel about being parents, how they mediate context influence these thoughts and feelings. For example, how school, community, and all the advice, for example, in Norway, we know that we have, that we have the, uh, the health professional also help uh, them, so the advice that they get from the community cultural values around parenthood and historical change. So then we're gonna try to go back also. Uh, how was that when you were a child? You see that they are different. So then we explore a bit those meanings. How do parents take care of their own feelings? So we, are, we have, uh, I have one master's student specifically working on self-compassion. How the parents, because one thing it's about knowing what I should do. Another thing is that, but I'm not always able to do it. And then how I feel towards myself, because that impacts a lot of mental health. If I start criticizing myself as a, as a mother all the time because I'm not able to do this and that. So we want to explore this uh, also, uh, because it may be that, for example, in the scale, the parents will reply a lot that, yeah, I don't talk about emotions and I'm just, and he's like, you know what? I don't have time. I don't have energy, I don't finish it, but I know that it's better to do like this. So the interview will go more in depth about this how and why. And, and, and the fact that there are groups, the groups is a social phenomenon in itself. So it's really interesting because there are some identification, but also you can see a bit more contradictions because then they change the way they think based on each other's comments. So it's a very kind of a fruitful way to analyze those topics. And as a final remarks, I would highlight that uh, we need more mixed method approach in order to identify, but also understand emotional socialization practice and process. It's not about identify a prevalence. Uh, we need that qualitative data is understood in its own epistemological terms, because sometimes we say like mixed methods, it's beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. oh, quantitative, qualitative, but then we have the quantitative mind. And we look to the qualitative data, trying to input all the reasoning that comes with numbers. But qualitative method has its own epistemological terms. Uh, and for that, we need a diverse research team. That's why in this project, we have quantitative researchers, we have qualitative researchers, we have researchers that work with twin designs uh, and developmental research, clinical, uh, research because indeed it, it's it's not enough to say that I would do mixed method, but if I don't know how to do mixed method, I cannot work with the twin design. So we need someone with the twin design background in the project. And I believe that this that we are doing here, international collaboration, is also really important when we think about the process. So I, I would like to highlight here that we need to discuss more the process of our research and not only our results. I think sometimes we are so eager to show uh, the findings, you know, and of course it's important the findings we're going to publish. I'm, I'm not saying that, but we, we have to remember that we're all educational institutions. We have to discuss for, uh, for our students and for ourselves. 
how we are doing our research. I think it's, and when we, 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 we talk uh, with different departments, different institutions from different uh, cultural realities, for example, this morning when Sabina was, how that will be if we collect the same data as Lilian presented, but in Brazil, not in Norway. I think we have to, to enlarge our way of doing research. And that's why I think we need to uh, share more the process. Uh, so I also believe that we also need to discuss more the new questions that emerge from our findings and not only our answers. I think that science is a ball that keeps rolling, right? So I think we have to st stimulate also our students to think about new questions and not only to provide answers. And here I finish my talk with some questions instead of answers. How about emotion socialization among peers? I believe children are active socializers. If you see and to observe children interacting with each other, there is a lot of uh, validation of emotion between them uh, or dismissing behavior. We have to look at that. Maybe children learn a lot from other children. There are very, very few studies uh, in this topic. I think we also should look to children's narrative, right? Talk, of course, at certain, from certain age. Uh, but what are the meanings and feelings about their parents' behavior towards their emotion? How they feel when the parents, for example, uh, do not validate their emotions? How they feel when the parents acknowledge? And maybe what we're going to find is that if children live in a culture in which dismissive uh, behavior is more allowed, it may be that the way they see this behavior is not that bad because that's the norm. I'm not saying that's good for some social outcomes or psychological outcomes, but it's important to understand their own view on this. Uh, I think we need to be very, very attentive to the pressure to, uh, a pressure to be good parents, because uh, we, we, we know a lot about, and I, here I also talk as a mom, we know a lot about child development, even if you are not a developmental psychologist, uh, especially with social media. And so, but the more we know, the more we tend to judge ourselves. Because we know, oh, I knew now I should have been very empathic. And I didn't show any empathy at all. And then I feel the worst mom in the world. Right? So self-compassionate parental practice, it's about this. And it's a very new field. And I hope maybe to present some data about this next time I come here. And my last question, which I think it's also a very ethical question, it's about how can we investigate and disseminate the results on emotion socialization that consider the child and the children's, uh, and uh, sorry, the child and the parents' perspectives and needs, as well as their cultural background. I think we need to be very careful to not be out there saying, uh, how parents should act, regardless of their future, regardless of their needs. So I think we need to be very ethical when we choose our methods and the way we disseminate our results. So I hope next time I will present uh, the results of this project. We finished the, the quantitative part and we are collecting the qualitative part now, but I'm really happy to share the process uh, with you. And uh, obrigada, and uh, thank you, Tak. What I, what I do? Before we open for questions, let's get back to that uh, environment. Yes, so we can see the chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can I cannot read from here, so if it does. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, no, I watch guess uh, this is the private chat, maybe. I think that's the private chat. Ah, okay, so so far we don't have questions in the chat. So okay. we can take questions from uh, the yes. You can yeah. stop sharing the screen. Yeah. Here? Yeah. 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 Here? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Thank you. So there are no, no questions. Can we ask questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, ask loud. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and what like what you said about think about what the process that yeah. results. Um, I was wondering uh, about this uh, interview with parents mm -hmm. uh, talking to them about what they think about the way they really raise their child. Uh, do you think that it may be a kind of therapeutic uh, role when you're talking about them? And if yes, it would be interesting to take a look about that. For instance, when parents start to think, what well, I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm doing the same that my father did to me when I was a child. I don't know if it's. I would not say that it's our Sorry, role. Maybe you just need to repeat what she said more or less. Okay, yeah, so Claudia Claudia asked if while conducting the interview, if it, we also might have some therapeutic uh, role, for example, when the parents might have some insights about their behavior. Uh, ethically, I would say that that should not be our role. When we do interview, we are doing as a researcher, not as a clinician. So we should avoid actually going to more kind of uh, issues that might create some anxiety. Uh, for them, but it may be that they have some therapeutic insight. That, that, that's okay. Uh, I think that can happen. Uh, but there are a lot, and that's why emotion socialization uh, research, they work a lot with intervention program. So then they have some clinical intervention. And then, uh, so the, here there is an aim to improve so, sort of some skills, competence in the parents. But for this interview, uh, what we hope is that they feel comfortable to share their feelings, their ideas. It might be that they have some insight, but we need to be careful to not kind of trigger anything that is not compatible with a research setting. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned social desirability mm. when you're answering questionnaires. I wonder how um, true is people's um, behavior when they're being filmed mm. to do this? Because then you have even more. I mean, how how long are they being? How long do you observe them for? Well, depends. Yeah, depends. Do you depends. Have strategies to try to diminish this kind of thing. Because I would expect I would. Um, I would behave differently if I knew that I was being filmed. Yes. That someone was uh, a little mm -hmm. bit how I looked after my time. Mm -hmm. so. And you are totally right. Mm -hmm. So we, we don't expect that when we are filming a uh, diet interaction that they are reproducing the real life yeah. interaction. So both methods or both instruments or way of uh, measuring, they have their limitations. So there are some social desirability uh, as well. But in a way, you have the interaction. You cannot control how the child, especially for the child, you cannot control how the child will reply. And I think when you are answering, you can like maybe yeah, really think about before answering. But both contains uh, the impact of the situation. And then when we analyze the interaction, we have to be aware about that. And uh, as a qualitative researcher, the way that uh, uh, we do to kind of control a bit for that is that we dis we try to minimize the influence, but we are aware that we cannot exclude all of this influence. So we try to make the setting as comfortable as possible. There is a bit of a warm up, so they start an interaction with an activity that we are not analyzing, that it's a bit unrelated to the topic, so that they get a bit familiar. Uh, usually, we try to film without the, the the researcher being there, so they cannot see. Uh, us, that's another strategy. Not always possible, but uh, if we have this condition in the lab, that uh, that helps. Uh, but the, I, 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 I would say that the warm up before it's very important to create a bit more yeah, relaxing kind of setting, but the influence will be there. So we are not expecting and that should be very 
clearly described, and that's what we call reflexivity in qualitative research. So we have to make that very clear that, that, that there is an influence. Yeah. Sorry. Mm. Yeah, yeah, sure. That one is that it doesn't child know. You have up to 12-year-olds. Yeah, yeah. Does the child know all the Yes, yes, yes. They, they, no, they have to. Ethically, they have to. Yeah. Even if they are younger, uh, we always tell the child that they are that they have been filmed. And it can be, for example, that the parent uh, authorized the participation, but if the child at the moment of the data collection said that I don't want to be filmed, so then we respect the child. Yeah. And how uh, many? So when, when you recruited these 5,000 families, mm -hmm. did they know about all these procedures? Because I'm wondering how uh, a parent who has difficulty yeah. in parenting, how uh, available would they be to this kind of yeah. procedure as well? Because if you already know, as you, as you said, most of us don't know well. Nobody taught us how to be parents, right? <laughs> yes. You have some references from your childhood, etc. But most, most of the time you know that that's not really ideal. Mm. So how do you get really, really complicated relationships or, or do the people just don't accept to take part in yeah, so in this case, the recruitment procedure, uh, it was as followed. So they there is a national register, so that, that's why we could have access to all of these parents. So they got an online information letter explaining just the quantitative part, okay? okay? So that's, so you're gonna fill in a form and that will take more or less and where the, the data will be stored. And then towards the end of the form, we explain that the study also contains some other studies that will include, for example, interview, and then they can tick if they can be, they are interested in being contact for that part of the study. Okay, so many had said yes. Uh, and now we are, and I didn't, uh, I didn't go through this, but now we are also in the part where we discuss how we're gonna sample. Because in qualitative studies, our sample are intentional. For example, I can create um, groups uh, which are homogeneous. I, I just want mothers. I want to understand how mothers, I just want fathers. I just want one group of Norwegians or a group of like different cultural background. What we need to know is that why I want that. What I will get if I compose the group like this. What I will get if I compose the diet like this. And because it follows a sequence, we can also look at the quantitative data to see how we're going to compose a diet and the groups. Because the qualitative part is to go more in depth. So the quantitative part is also informative. Okay, that's the numbers that we have. What we want to understand a bit more in depth that helps us to understand this statistical analysis. And also now we are starting looking at the numbers, at the quantitative results, to think what is more interesting for our aims in terms of the composition of the groups and also the composition of the diets. But we have many who said, uh, so we have more than enough for a qualitative uh, design. To be contact for this uh, other yeah, studies. Yeah, I was wondering because I thought that the really really complicated parents yeah. probably wouldn't accept. Right? Yes. So yeah. you can really get the really really. Yeah, there is a problem. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Really lose their temper and you know. Yeah, and I'm also expecting that we're gonna have more mothers than fathers. Oh, yeah. yeah, because I've been conducting uh, interviews in another project uh, with parents in Norway, and it was really, really hard. Like, we extend the recruitment, we use another tool, because we just had mothers, 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 even in Norway. They have some campaign that is, by the way, right, touching parents, fathers, yeah. say, look, your role is really important. important yeah. Science knows nothing about it. Yeah. <laughs> Empowered yes, them. yes, we, 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 need, we really need to find some strategies here, because, yeah. So it is context. I have some follow-up questions. If you have no, okay. So uh, uh, the first one is: uh, I assume that you uh, that you might not have had an exact number, and that's perfectly okay. But just thinking about the practicalities of your workflow uh, as a uh, rough estimate, how 
many parents do you aim to recruit for this interactional part, for this recording part? Yeah, 30. 13? No, 30. 30. 30. Yeah, okay. And the people taking part in this parental uh, interaction and uh, afterwards being shown that uh -huh. the videos are the same participants that are taking part in the focus group. Are you using some sort of triangulation? with the same participants or are they different? That's the original idea, okay. but that's something that we are also discussing. Mm -hmm. But I would prefer to say yes. I think that would be really awesome if we could have the same parents and the, like the online form with all the quantitative measures, the interaction and the focus group. But then again, there is a kind of the response might be that okay no the video is enough for me or maybe there are parents that say i'm oh, because the, the, the interaction it involves the child yeah. you know so it may be that for some parents like i'm okay in participating in the interview but not the, the recording but i we will try as much as we can to have the same group yeah so yeah and one last question thinking about the parental engagement in mm. this project. I was wondering whether they would be offered some sort of compensation to take part. Yeah, they got some uh, some uh, money uh, to yeah to participate. Yeah. Uh, it's not allowed here. Brazil, yeah. you cannot. Yeah. You cannot pay, so we cannot give gifts. You cannot give. Yeah, for uh, there yeah. Okay. But th th there is any question from uh, the online? What is the uh, last words for yeah so then yeah so we are closing the the section thank you for all, all of you who have been there i hope you have enjoyed yeah and you know my my email i think uh yeah. yes so if you are interested in the topic or if you have any further question just get in contact i'll be very glad and happy to reply thank you so much obrigado Sair do estúdio?